Well, we are here today with Noreen Young, who is a notable Canadian producer and puppeteer. She's the creator of the beloved CBC Canadian kids show Under the Umbrella Tree, which aired from 1986 to 1993. She is a celebrated and noted puppet designer, having designed many of the puppets used on many TV Ontario shows, including Read Along and Calling All Safety Scouts and Today's Special. She's the artistic director in the annual interna of the annual inter international puppet festival, Puppets Up, and she is the recipient of the Order of Canada for, co for her contributions to Canadian educational television. Thank you so much, Noreen, for being with us today. We're excited to interview you. Well, thank you for being here and being on Skype. And this is my second time on Skype, so... <laughs> we're, we're excited to have you, and uh, we, appreciate, we appreciate you giving the time to do this. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, Noreen, and how you got involved in Canadian television. How did it all begin? Uh, well, I grew up in Ottawa, uh, in Ottawa South, and which is now called Old Ottawa South. It was a lovely neighborhood for, uh, to grow up in, and uh, my two brothers and I um, lived there for our childhood, and uh, I was always interested in art and making things, and uh, one of the things I really got interested in was puppetry and um, making puppets. and. One day, a father uh, of one of my fellow students at Hopewell Avenue School, where I used to go for the public elementary school, brought in a set of uh, carved Pinocchio puppets, which he donated to the school. And I'd never seen it before in my life, and I was really, really absolutely fascinated by it. And um, he gave it to the school, and uh, then for some reason, I ended up with one of them, um, and it kind of set me off on my career. That's how it all started. That's how it all began. Yeah. I don't think I stole that puppet. <laughs> I think I took it back. <laughs> what attracted you <laughs> so to... I recall it out, they all got kind of disbanded at one point, and my favorite teacher, uh, auditorium teacher he was called, which was sort of theater arts, said... Uh, here, Noreen, you take this one. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Cool. No, it's all good. <laughs> Digression is good. What attracted you to children's educational television, and in what ways are being a puppeteer on screen different than being a regular on screen actor? Well, I've never been a regular on screen actor because I just, I'm not good at it. And so the next best thing is to be off screen but on screen with a puppet and so it really appealed to me to uh, be a television puppeteer because that's really where my specialty lay. I never was in a, a theater puppeteer. Um, it's only now that I'm trying to find troops for our puppet festival that I've got a whole lot more awareness of uh, theater puppetry which is like a whole other field and it's fascinating. But um, what was your other question? <laughs> I, in what ways are being a puppet puppeteer oh, yeah, actor what? different than an on-screen actor? Um, well, I mean, you're hiding. You're you're behind the puppet. You are speaking through the puppet. I guess that's the best uh, way to explain it. So, and and how I got into educational television. I mean, that was uh, not really intentional. It was because I was invited by. Um, Ken Sobel, who was a writer at TV Ontario, to think up some characters for a series that he was writing called uh, Read Along. And he had seen my work on CBC because I, I was uh, doing some shows on CBC and asked if I would like to um, come up with some ideas for characters for a show that he was developing. So it was really through Ken Sobel that I got involved in educational TV. What shows were you doing on the CBC? Um, prior to him calling you? Um, well, I was doing a show called High Diddle Day, which was on CBC for 10 years, and um, also then a show called Pencil Box, and uh, I did a show, uh, segments for a show called What's New on CBC, and uh, CTV as well. I did a little French language show series called Voici Babou, and that was really one of my earlier shows. So I was doing that stuff, and he, Ken, called me up and asked if I would like to um, 
think of a, uh, some characters for read along. He had the characters in his head, but he wanted to have puppets made of them. So it was thanks to Ken Sobel, who was a great champion of mine at TV Ontario. Very cool. Have you created puppets for odd adult audiences? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I um, have done like political caricatures. I did uh, this series called What's New, which was for um, older kids in grade seven, eight, maybe. Um, and it was a news roundup show that CBC did. And I would do uh, puppets of the prime ministers of the time and uh, different uh, political characters. <laughs> And uh, I, I didn't do the voice. The voices were all pre-recorded, and um, some of, some pretty big names, you know, got some quick cash writing these sketches. And Dave Thomas was one of them. Oh wow! And um, believe it or not, Jim Carrey, you know, way 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 back, he wrote some of them. And uh, the guys from um, the Canadian Air Force wrote some as well. Roger Abbott and Don Ferguson, and that was pretty amazing to work on that show. And now I do uh, caricatures of people just as art commissions, and that's pretty challenging as well. When did you first get serious about building puppets and said, I'm going to make a career out of this? Um, well, I went... I made them when I was a kid, and then I thought, well, I'm artistic, so I'll go to art school. So I went to uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. At that time, it was just the Ontario College of Art. Their design has been added on in the last few years, and uh, took uh, fine art, drawing and painting. And um, then I decided on the third year that this was kind of lonesome, and uh, I didn't particularly want to suffer in an attic somewhere and I was a little bit more sociable than I should be for a, um, a fine artist. And so I thought, well, gee, I, I, I like to make puppets. Maybe I'll get back to building. And so I did. And um, then I would take the puppets I've made and put them in a basket and go knock on doors at the CBC in Ottawa <laughs> and CJOH, or that was the CTV channel then. So. I would just go bang on doors with my little basket of puppets and see if anybody wanted to hire me as a puppeteer or a puppet builder. Wow. You really, That's you how really, it started. You and really and I, was, I was lucky that I started really at the right time because mm -hmm. at that time there were a lot of opportunities and everything was just kind of getting going in the Ottawa area anyway with uh, puppet uh, shows with puppets in them, and um, I, I lucked in that way, so it was a good time. It was a, it's the right time. You clearly, you clearly believed in your skill and talent, and that's wonderful to think that you, you know, made that kind of effort to go and knock on doors and say, hey, this is what I have to offer. What are some of the favorite puppets that you've made? Um, well, the first puppets I made uh, was for a show called High Diddle Day, and the characters that I, in that show, was um, there were six characters operated by two puppeteers. And Bob Dermer was the other puppeteer, and he and I worked together for 10 years on this show. And he did uh, Druid the Dragon, Wolfgang the Wolf, and Chico the Crow. And I did Basil the Beagle, Granny, and Mrs. Diddle. And uh, there were other incidentally, in incidental characters but those were the main six characters and now you mentioned so you mentioned granny did granny <laughs> was that the same granny that would appear in read along and uh, no that was a different granny okay yeah but i guess mrs diddle was a good character for me and basil and then later with under the umbrella tree i really enjoyed uh, i liked uh, gloria a lot because i did i performed her and voiced her well i see gloria gloria's picture on your back wall there yeah, that's right. I, I have the puppet here, too, if you want to see her. Sure. I just brought her up. Oops, just a minute. I mean, I didn't throw up, but I brought her up from the basement. That's where she lives. <laughs> wow, so this is the original puppet that would have been used on Under the Umbrella Tree. Oops, just and, and was, uh, that's was it... right, that's me, Gloria the Gopher. <laughs> well, hello, Gloria. Very nice to meet you. Hi, Travis. I don't know where to look. <laughs> now, Gloria, do you do you There's have a the camera? There it is, right there. Hello. 
Hi, Gloria. Now, do you have a twin? Do you have a backup, Gloria, or is it just you? Um, there's one backup, Gloria. Iggy's got four of him, <laughs> and Jacob's got two. <laughs> My goodness, that's great. Now, Noreen And I come apart, you know. My arms come off. My <laughs> legs snap off. <laughs> And my head comes off, too. That's now, did, because you need to get dressed fast. That, that's and incredible. Just as long as your puppeteer head doesn't come off and, and, and all the rest. <laughs> so, uh, Noreen, was that, the, was that the only puppet in your career that you did the voice for, or did you do other voices as well? Well, I did the voices for uh, Granny and Miss Diddle and Basil and all the puppets in that show. Okay. and. Uh, Puppets in the pencil box and, uh, and of course, uh, under the umbrella tree and a few other things. But when I worked at TV Ontario, all the voices were recorded. Right. And uh, they were done by some pretty well-known people like Max Ferguson. Max Ferguson did the voice <laughs> of Granny and Boot and uh, Pretty. Uh, no, and, and also... Um, Jack du no Jack Duffy did, did the voice of Boot, and um, yeah, I can't remember the others. Anyway, they were, it was all pre-recorded. Now, of all the puppets that you've done, because you've had quite an expansive career, which would you say are the ones that are most recognized by kids? Which ones you just knew for whatever reason they hit the bell, they had longevity, and you still have kids recognizing certain puppets? Wh which ones would those be? Well, the kids that the kids that recognize the puppets now are like twenty-year-olds uh, who recognize the puppets from under the umbrella tree. Um, certainly, they would recognize some of the puppets that were used on Read Along and Tele Francais, maybe. Like a lot of kids watch TV Ontario for mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah, right now. I can get people excited when I bring out Gloria, but they have to be between 20 and 30 <laughs> to, to remember. <laughs> and, and actually that's handy because they're starting to have kids too. So, um, and we just, I just uh, signed a contract with a company in the States to show um, uh, Under the Umbrella Tree on a, a channel, like a, a Netflix kind of a channel. Very cool. Very so it's yeah. still it still have long, it still has longevity. Does CBC own the rights to uh, to broadcast under the umbrella tree, or is that co-owned no. by you? I own that. Oh wow! It so, was a co-production. Very cool. I was an independent producer. Very cool. So, so yeah. you have you have access to all the master tapes of all the episodes. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's uh, let's shift a little bit and talk more specifically about TV Ontario. I know you had mentioned Ken Sobel. Was he the one? Was he the guy that actually hired you to work for TV Ontario? No, he um, at that time Ruth Vernon was head of the children's department at TV Ontario, and uh, Ken did a lot of work with Ruth and uh, Jennifer Harvey, mm -hmm. and um, he created Read Along and uh, Tele Francais and. Um, and a number of others I can't I think he did he created all the ones that I worked on because he was very well thought of and he and Ruth Vernon got along really well and um, he was a very innovative kind of writer I mean his writing was oddball and off the wall but it sort of really captured kids and uh, so he I think it was because of him he didn't hire me he didn't sign the contract but he pretty well pulled me in. Right. Would it have been Ruth Vernon that actually made it official and hired you on? Yes. Very cool. Yes, she was a very fine lady, and she liked my puppets very much. And so for a while there, I had a really good run, and uh, I was very grateful for that. Well, last January we had an event, and I was able to meet Ruth and Jennifer in person and interview them. And I, I agree with that statement. They are very lovely people and very thankful for their, their hard work at TV Ontario. Yeah. Um, when researching your career, it became apparent that you had the opportunity to work with a lot of different people um, at TV Ontario. Who specifically made an impact on you while you were there, and how did they do that? Um, well, I, I mean, 
I think Ken's at the top of the list and uh, Ruth and Jennifer and um, Dave Moore also was a director there and he worked on uh, um, uh, he worked on Read Along I think and certainly Telefonce and um, you, I can't remember the other name of the the director, you know him. You know him. Uh, Jed Mackay? No. Hmm. Another, yeah, it's, another director. Yeah. Well, if it, com if it comes to you, it comes to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then there was a really great uh, floor director, that tall, skinny... Peter Newman? Peter Newman. He was mm -hmm. amazing. He was wonderful to work with, yeah. Very he just cool. made everything happen. <laughs> Very cool. He lived on the island, and he always had to, didn't like to work late, because he had to make the ferry to go across to the island to go home, so. He kept things rolling, so people got out of there in time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, some have suggested that TV Ontario was really a pioneer in leading, leading children's education. How would you describe the atmosphere of TVO and the family of people you worked with? Well, that, when I worked there, it was really, really great, and... Uh, I had a wonderful time and everybody seemed to get along just fine. I mean, I wasn't involved at all in the production side of things, like putting it all together. I, I worked in the studio, so when we came in, all the tapes were recorded, like the voice tapes were recorded and gotcha. uh, scripts were written, and we just came in and did our job with the puppets and um, made it the best we could, and that was our, our part of it. Um, I had a wonderful time, and as I said, it was a really busy, busy, packed amount of time. And um, when I when I finished, I finished, and I I didn't go back at all. Like I haven't been back to do any work there since because they, I mean, obviously they wanted to try other other puppet builders and other puppeteers, and uh, it was time for a change. And that leads me. Well, into the next question, um, when what were the years, if you were to kind of do a guesstimate, that you were working for TV Ontario off and on? Oh gosh, it really got me there. I would. So read along. Read along would be about seventy eighties, the seventies and eighties. Yeah, read along would be around seventy five. Yeah. So probably into the eighties as well. I think the last one I did was Arts Place. That was an art show. That was the series at TV Ontario, and I think that was that was the last one that I did. But I did about f five or six different series. And you've mentioned a couple of those. You mentioned Tele Français and Read Along. Um, I think Calling, Calling, All, Calling All Safety Scouts was another one. W which ones were your favorite? I, I like. Well, I liked. I guess I like Read Along and Tele Français the best. They were. Certainly, the biggest projects and um, the characters were fun. Like the main puppet character in Tele Francais was a pineapple, An Anana. He was the uh, the hero. So that's pretty strange to have a series written around a pineapple. Yeah, it, it was very, very, very unique. I remember having to watch that for French class in uh, yeah. in grade <laughs> school. <laughs> now. Yeah. You had mentioned Bob Dermer. What other fellow TV Ontario actors and puppeteers have you worked with? And do you have any funny stories or fond memories of working with them? Well, I was certainly Bob Dermer I worked with a lot. Like he and I worked together for 10 years on uh, a show, the High Diddle Day show. And then um, Mina Keogh I've worked with a lot and uh, at Tele Francais. And uh, Bob Stutt. And um, w Wendy Welch, and um, my brother Stephen Brathwaite, he's a puppeteer as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I guess Bob, I don't know, Bobby Dermer and I did quite a lot of read along, and uh, I said Wendy Welch, didn't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was mostly. Bob and and, um, and and me and Stephen and Bob Stutt. 
because you you come in and you do little small segments like they weren't great big scenes like you do in uh, Sesame Park or um, under the, like the, you know they they were fairly simple limited setups so you can handle it with two puppeteers for sure right right did you have any um did you have any involvement in today's special did you build muffy yes i did yeah and were there any other uh, pups i built sam and muffy built the, those two characters for them in that in that show i i was the puppet builder very cool so you would have built mrs pennypacker as well uh, no, I didn't. That must have been Nina. I think Nina Keo built that. She's also a puppet builder. Because there is a difference between puppeteering and puppet builder. I noticed you had that question on your list that further down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can feel free to answer that as well. What is the difference? Well, if you build the puppet and you operate the puppet, you can build a puppet... Um, just for your own hand, so it'll be too small for somebody else's hand, and they won't be able to hire other people. They'll have to hire you. But that's a mean thing to do. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a lot of puppeteers that don't build puppets. In fact, there's more puppeteers that don't build than the puppeteers that do. There's not that many builders. Mm. Right now, it's the, there's a really good puppet builder who happens to be my sister-in-law, Vicky Veenstra, and she gets a lot of the work now, so wow. she works with a lot of uh, Montreal companies, builds puppets for them. Very cool. Now, you had mentioned that the segments when you did them on TV Ontario were short and they weren't as exhaustive as some of the other work you did on Under the Umbrella Tree. Uh, were, were there any other differences in terms of the work that you did for TV Ontario versus the CBC or other networks? Was there anything specifically different about working for TVO? Well, I mean, there is a certain way to um, write and uh, produce um, shows where you want to teach kids something. I mean, there has to be a very careful um, focus of the uh, stuff that you're doing because you're actually trying to teach something. I mean, you're teaching reading with read-along or you're teaching French with uh, Telefrancais, so there's there's repetition, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, cutting away to examples of things that the puppets are talking about, and in that case they would use sometimes live action with real kids or graphics or animation. The puppets were um, part, uh, they were an element of the overall package that was teaching something, so... Mm. Um, there were a lot of cutaways and uh, a lot of talking directly to camera because uh, you were trying to teach something and make sure and speaking clearly and of course all the tapes voice tapes were done before we got in the studio so they had been directed as well so that the teaching was foremost entertainment was certainly important but the teaching was paramount and I think that most people would agree that that was the forte of TV Ontario, just their unique ability to write, you know, scripts that could really teach kids. And you probably know this by now, like the longevity of the shows that TV Ontario produces is outstanding. It's amazing that so many people, just because it was inundated in the schools and in the curriculum, how many people actually remember Read Along and Telefrancais. In fact... Jennifer Harvey and Ruth Verna were telling me that some of the most um, encouraging letters that they ever received from kids are kids that are now adults that struggled with learning how to read, but learned to read through Read Along, which is a hats off to you as well, because it was your puppets that communicated that. And I think that's an incredible thing. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, kids did see a lot of that in their, in their classrooms. They were actually sitting down in their class watching it. Unfortunately, they don't run anymore um, because uh, at the time, TVO paid their performers a base rate and you would earn extra money if the series got sold, you would receive a royalty, but they never bought a page of a buyout. So uh, they can't run today's special now because it would cost them an awful lot of money to... Um, to rebroadcast them. So 
there was no buyout. You you worked for scale, and if they sold the series, you were lucky enough to get a royalty. But um, I, I'm not sure how that works exactly. But uh, it's too expensive for them to rerun them. Hmm. Now, do you have any puppets, pictures, or videos, or anything from your work that you saved from TV Ontario? Um, I don't have any videos because, well, no, I don't have any videos because really you couldn't own them. I mean, they were not, they were the property of TV Ontario and they didn't like to give their tapes out. And I never recorded anything off screen. I have some, uh, I did a lot of artwork for them at one point and I do have uh, posters and things that I I designed for them. Like this is, um, that's a poster of Granny. Oh, that, very cool. That I did and that they handed out to schools. And then here's one of, uh, I don't remember the word vendor. It's the yep. word vendor. Yeah, I do remember that. So you uh, you actually designed those posters and drew them? Yeah, yeah, I, I did them. And um, also they, they put out, uh, here's the Explorer. And, and the whole, remember? I don't know if you remember that. Yep, I do. Yeah. And they also did um, books that, um, that, kids, that they give to kids in school in a kind of a learning package because the video was only part of the whole package. The video was accompanied by print material and these posters and all kinds of stuff for the kids. So that's a, a reader. That's read-along one. And um, I did the illustrations for it with one of the um, staff graphic artists at TVO, Joyce Crosby, Cosby, sorry. Very cool. So that would and have been the, Tom Pillsworth. That would have been the teacher's yeah. um, guide for for teaching yeah. curriculum. Pretty, pretty much. I mean, it was uh, yeah, it was a teacher's guide. Can you show us a couple of the pages on the inside? Yeah. Just a second here. Like, here's a picture of, of Granny sort of jumping into the water. Granny going for a swim. Yeah. Here's, here's boot, boot and Pretty. Very good. So, yeah, so I, I did their readers um, with Joyce Cosby and um, the graphic department. That was really nice. That was like an extra contract to do that. Here's the elephant and the thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that was that was neat. I was really glad to do that. No. But I don't own any of the puppets. They, they, um, actually, three of them now live in the Museum of Civilization in Ottawa. Uh, Boot and Pretty and Granny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually about just to mention that. How does that make you feel that your work has been preserved in such an honorable way? Well, it's great. I, I like it. They Mostly they live on a shelf somewhere in their uh, storage room, but it's a climate-controlled storage room, and uh, they get dusted off now and again, and, and occasionally they'll come out in a show, but they're part of the national heritage, national treasure. They're a national treasure. They are a national treasure, and I think yeah. uh, I think many people in Ontario would agree. Well, really across Canada too, because I know those shows were broadcast across the country. Well, we want to shift into talking a little bit about puppeteering and designing, which I know is is your forte. And we've, um, pardon me, we've talked a little bit about the relationship between the puppeteer and the puppet designer already. But tell me this: what efforts do you make when you're creating a puppet um, to honor the puppeteer? and to honor the sketch from the creator? Like, well, what are you given? Like, how does, how does the initial idea or concept begin when it doesn't originate with you? Um, well, most of the time the puppets I built originated from me and I did the original sketches which were presented to the director or the producer or whatever. But there have been times for sure when I've done puppets that were from somebody else's sketch or drawing and um, you just do your best to make it look like what they want and uh, you have to make it workable. It's got to be uh, something that someone can animate and manipulate and, um, and, and that's where being a puppeteer comes in handy because you know 
you know, how you want it to move. So, so when you built, for instance, Sam Crenshaw, um, my understanding from talking with Bob Dermer is that Sam was actually used in a pilot for another TV Ontario series that never aired. But did, did Clive Vanderberg come to you and say, hey, I want a puppet that's a night watchman. Um, he's an elderly guy. Go to it. Is that basically what happened? Yeah, or? I think Bob's right. I think it was something that I'd made for something else. And I can't remember what that is at all. But Muffy, uh, <clears throat> they wanted a little mouse. And so I I built a mouse for them <laughs> that wasn't anything too specific. They just kind of, they pretty much let me have free reign. Um and then Nina made it her own, of course. I mean, once you get the puppeteer going and the puppet is just the start because you have to build a character and a personality and that comes through the puppeteer. Now, during the series, would you, um, for instance, since we're talking about today's special, during that series, would the puppets ever break down or fall apart or would Nina ever come to you and say, hey, I need a little bit more space for my hand or my thumb or yeah. and there would be upgrades done to the puppets? Yeah, there has to be. I mean, I always thought they were puppets were kind of like ballet slippers because you, uh, you know, you had they did a lot of pounding away and uh, sweating, and uh, it's hard work to be a puppeteer and to uh, it's physical exercise, and you do a lot of sweating, and sometimes the puppets uh, feel that effect. And yes, a hand drops off, or yes, a uh, an ear falls off, and uh, uh, now and again they need a good overhaul. And um, you just me, I, I get out the glue gun. I'm called the glue gun queen, and <laughs> glue back on the ear or whatever, and um, or re sew or they they always need a kind of little tune up. Yeah, very cool. And during the series, would puppets have like a foam box that they would be placed in? You know, are there puppet, are there boxes that are, uh, oh, I'm almost thinking of like a hard shell flight case that has foam inside to protect the puppet. Well, I, I think that the um, Children's Television Workshop who built the puppets for uh, Sesame Park that CBC did, I think they all came in these special boxes and, uh, but then they had to go back and forth across the border because they would be sent back for refurbishing and, uh, but um, I, I usually carried my puppets around in big wicker baskets and uh, <laughs> nothing too fancy. While we're talking, uh, we'll just divert just for a quick second. D tell me, did you ever have any interaction with CBC and Sesame Park or Jim Henson Productions or anything like that? No, I didn't. I, I met Jim Henson a couple of times and he was a very lovely man and I, I never did work on Fraggle Rock, which was the Canadian production that he was so involved in and was produced in Toronto but uh, and a lot of Canadian puppeteers learned their chops on that show um, but I, 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 I met him a couple of times and he's a very lovely man. <clears throat> Who would you say are some of your favorite puppeteers? Who do you look up to? <clears throat> well I'm, I'm a very I'm very fond of Bob Stutt and his work. <clears throat> I've worked with him so much in so many years, and uh, I really do respect his puppetry. And um, <clears throat> most of my colleagues, they're all good, you know, they all do their very best. And Trish Leeper is a very good puppeteer, and uh, she did, I think she did some work at TVO. She worked with uh, Nina and Stephen on a production, I can't remember what the name was, but. Um, and Rob Mills is a wonderful puppeteer, and uh, I actually inherited his character from Sesame Park because he started off the character Dodie, who was the old granny that flew in the plane, and then he got really, really busy and had to step away, and uh, they asked me if I'd like to take over from that character, and I was very happy to do that. It was fun. Pierre Paquette is, is another puppeteer that I had a good time with. He's pretty crazy. <laughs> Help us to understand some of the struggles of puppeteering. What, what are some things that the average person may not know about this skill? Well, of course, there's all kinds of different puppetry, 
marionettes and hand puppets and shadow puppets and all kinds of stuff. But the puppets that you see on TV are mostly like the Muppet Show type puppets where they work from below. And uh, they're called hand and rod puppets so that the hand is in the head operating the mouth and then the other hand holds the rods and um, so they're and they're worked up over your head like that so working over your head for long periods of time gets pretty tiring and you can only do it for so long and then uh, you have to hide yourself and you have to get yourself into all these little behind sets and in positions and stuff and all the puppeteers are kind of jammed in together and <laughs> That's how you get to know your friends really well. and uh, You want to make sure you wear underarm deodorant and smell nice. Yeah. <laughs> I've always thought that it would be a good ad for deodorant if they'd used a puppeteer, but they never have done that. <laughs> it's too gross, I don't know. In brief, can you tell us a little bit about how puppets are typically constructed? Maybe you can start with the kind that you were just mentioning. And wh which are the most, well, you've answered this, which are the most popular kinds? How long does it take to build a standard hand and rod puppet? Well, you can build one in a day if you want to, but it's certainly not going to be that detailed, but um, it depends. It, it, it depends on how, you know, how careful and how uh, proud you are of the actual puppet building. Um, you could take forever to build a puppet, but uh, usually there's timelines in television anyway, and you got to build one fairly quickly. So I, I usually took about a week to build one, but I don't know. Everybody's different. I don't know. Do you know Ronnie Burkett, who's a wonderful marionette builder? He's His puppets are probably the epitome of the best-built puppets in Canada, um, and he takes a great deal of care over his puppets, and he's quite strict about how they're made, and he's, um, he takes a great deal of pride in the building. As I told you, I, I'm being always called the glue gun queen. I'm a little bit of a slapdash builder, but uh, it worked for me. Where do you normally start? Do you start with the body or the head? Oh, the head. I have the to head. do the head first, yeah. Well, I, I build puppets a lot out of a liquid, using liquid rubber. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people like to do that. They prefer foam or fleece and all that stuff. And, and I like that too, I have to say. But my kind of signature is always being the sculpted uh, look, which is translated into rubber. And so the mouth is flexible and the nose is flexible and... Um, and they're quite durable. People think that rubber kind of decays, but I've, I have puppets that are like 30, 40 years old, and they're still still cooking away, you know. I can still make the mouth go. Now, Sam Crenshaw... You notice have it dropped off, yeah. Sam Crenshaw, would he be a, a, a rubber puppet, the face? He was. He is. But he had a very bad accident. Yeah, we <laughs> talked about this. He had a, he had a little problem with his nose. Book. A bookshelf dropped on his nose. There's oh. a lot. There's a lot of today's special fans out here that are going to be crying in anguish to know that <laughs> Sam <laughs> Crenshaw needs a nose job. He does. Poor guy. He actually, he actually have to be re-poured, but unfortunately, I don't have the cast anymore. He'd have to be remodeled. <laughs> Start it all over again. <laughs> He needs a he needs a remodeling. Sam Crenshaw. He needs to go on that show. Like what? What are they do? Makeover, all yeah. American makeover, or something like that. Yeah. Well, a couple of wrap up questions here as we finish up. What would you say, Noreen, has been the highlight of your career and why? Well, I I think the highlight was producing under the umbrella tree because I was the executive producer and it was something that I fought for for seven years to get it on the air and finally um, they decided to run it and uh, I was involved in every aspect of that series and then I also got to uh, build the puppets and um, to be Gloria, one of the three main puppet characters and it, so it was wonderful to have that artistic uh, input and control and um, 
it also was the most, it was such a fun show to do. All puppet shows are fun, I have to tell you that, because puppeteers are crazy and wacko, and there's a lot of laughs when you're doing puppetry for television anyway. And um, so I would say that Under the Umbrella Tree was the high, one of the highlights. And, and now I'm, I'm doing the puppet festival in my little town here of Almont, and uh, that's pretty exciting too, And because I'm, I'm now bringing puppet troops to our town for our festival, and so I'm getting to have a real appreciation for touring companies and um, live uh, puppet theater and Every every project is a highlight of my career. <laughs> now, now, tell me a little bit more about why Under the Umbrella Tree was such a hard sell initially to the CBC and what kind of obstacles you were up against. Um, I'm not sure because it's all it all happens behind closed doors. You never know what the priorities are for the uh, program directors mm -hmm. and... Um, have most of the time your your uh, your timing's just not right. They don't need a show, or they can't afford a new show. Or, but I think the Friendly Giant was a fifteen minute show, and we were pushing a fifteen minute show. And um, his show had gone on for thirty years, and I think they were kind of looking for a change. And um, so our show under the umbrella tree came in to his spot and uh, when his show was dropped and for a while they were called the giant killers oh, and <laughs> we're also a regional production you know from Ottawa and a co-production so uh, it wasn't one of CBC's um, pure lane uh, productions it, it, but it, it was on the air for um, Started in '87 and went. To, it was the last show was produced in '93, but then it was on the Disney Channel for quite a long time after that. So it had a good, it had a good run of about ten years. And the concept behind the show was that in your mind as early as the late '70s or the early '80s? No, it would have been. Uh, well, it, it '87. Yeah, '80. It started in '80 because it went on the air in '87. Yeah. So in, in 1980, um, the concept was started. Yeah, and you had the ideas and for the character. And so often, as I re bring it right back to CBC, I was forever flogging it. And uh, <laughs> good for you. So, yeah, so that's you, how you, you have to do it. Nobody comes knocking at your door. You got to go knock on on their door. <laughs> so <it's>, hello. <laughs> So from the early from the early times, would you have had um, even the characters in your head, the ideas of what they were, and the concept and the plot behind the show? Yeah, pretty much the basic plot. And but the characters didn't really develop totally until the puppeteers got going with them, and the first year was sort of a write off. I I haven't kept any of the shows from the first year because I would be ashamed to show them. But the second, third, and fourth. Um, series were kept for sure and all the specials now because you own the rights have you ever I'm sure there's people that want to know the, the answer to this question have you ever considered releasing them on DVD well I did they, okay they were for sale for a while yeah okay because I know that yeah. some people are still looking still looking for stuff like that on eBay and, and whatnot are they still available through your website I don't have a website but uh, no, I, I, sh I shut it down, but actually now that they're going to be distributed through um, a, a, a channel called, or at least a um, website called Storybox. Okay. And that's going to be up and running very shortly, in the next few weeks actually. So Die Hard Under the Umbrella Trees can look up Storybox and, and be yeah. excited to see them on there. And you mentioned that that's kind of like a Netflix streaming. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. Well, um, you're a very modest and humble lady, but you are a recipient <laughs> of the Order of Canada. So explain to yeah. me how this came about and how this made you feel like this is the highest civilian honor you can get as a Canadian. Tell me about this and do you have the medal with you? Oh, I don't. Did you want to see it? I, I think fans would be willing to wait a second if you know where it is. 
I do. Do you want to wait for me? We will wait oh. for you. Okay, I'll just I'll just be ready. Here I am. <laughs> so well, tell us how this came about. What What is the story, and how did this make you feel? This is amazing. Oh well, this was fabulous. It, it, <clears throat> I'm not sure how it came about. I mean, there were people who had nominated me or put my name forward, and um, I think it takes a while for you to actually build up a fairly significant file before they'll think of you as a recipient and. Um, I'm not sure who who put my name forward and have all of that work because they're pretty quiet about it. But uh, I did get a letter in the mail one day telling me that I got the order. And uh, I remember sitting down in my kitchen, kitchen table and uh, reading the letter and crying. It was just so wonderful to have this honor and to, like all the years of working and and it was very, very touching. And then we went to uh, the Governor General's residence at one point and with all the other people who got the order that year. I got it in 1995 and uh, we presented it by the Governor General and uh, you just feel so proud and kind of bewildered as you wonder what the heck you did to deserve it really. And then from then on, you're working like mad to earn it. <laughs> <laughs> You're working even harder than you did before. Well, it's just you feel, how come you gave it to me? And then you sort of work like stink to earn it. Right. Anyway, right. So what, what you get is this lovely uh, pin here that you can wear at ceremonial occasions. And you wear it on, your, on the left side because that's where they tell you you have to wear it. There's a strict strict rules about all this but you don't wear this except if you're reviewing the troops or or at some kind of uh, occasion government occasion so what you do mostly and what you'll see on like Peter Mansbridge's lapel are these little tiny pins I don't know you can hardly see it it's just they're like an earring and you wear that on a on your clothing sort of here. Okay. It's just a tiny little pin. Very neat. So, did yeah. you have any idea that you were being uh, considered for this award prior to this, or did this come out of nowhere? It came out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, I could see how that would just fill you with emotion and why you would, how you would cry. <laughs> did they, did they give you a certificate or anything like that as well? Oh yeah, I have it up over my uh, my desk. I, I I can't turn the the computer around to show you, but, well, maybe I can, can I? You can try yeah. if you want, yeah. Well, never mind. It's it's framed. It's a very beautiful uh, certificate. Can you read and to us? And it's done in calligraphy. Somebody did it by hand. Wow. Can you read to us what it says? Oh, it's, <laughs> oh, no, it, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> never mind. It's, but it, it was a very big honor, and uh, and I was very, very, very proud and very grateful. Very cool. Well, we and, all and we and I, I use it. I'm I'm not. I don't keep it in a drawer. And I, when I'm promoting the puppet festival, we always, you know, we use it as me being a recipient of the Order of Canada. So it sounds like I'm really legit. You know, <laughs> at the festival. Is being run by somebody who's uh, credible. <laughs> well, I certainly think that you are credible, and you have made just incredible contributions to uh, to Canadian culture. And I think it's a wonderful legacy that you have been part of using your skill and using your talent to educate masses of kids. There's kids in Canada that know how to read, that know how to write, that know how to spell, that know how to do math, that know how to do reading, writing, and arithmetic because you gave your life to a career that taught them these things. And I think that is an incredible legacy to live. So final question. When people look back on you 40 years from now, how would you prefer to be remembered? 
I guess as somebody who had a lot of fun and made a lot of goofy characters and fun characters and uh, had a lot of laughs. It was good. It was very enjoyable. It's been an amazing way to make a living. No doubt. And I did make a kind of a living. <laughs> I did kind of make a living. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did make a living. <laughs> My goodness. No, it's been great. And it, it's not over yet because it's the puppet festival kind of keeps keeps going. And, uh, you know, it's fun. It's great fun. Very cool. Very cool. Well, many who are watching, Noreen, are thankful for your contribution to Canadian educational television. And I just want to personally thank you for giving this interview and for really devoting your life to, to what you've done. And uh, it's so wonderful to know that you're still out there, you're active, um, and you're doing the Puppets Up. I know people can Google that if they want to learn more about that. And, yeah, uh, we do have a website for that. Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, I know we'll chat for a couple of minutes here when we're done, but uh, just as I get ready to click stop on the record thing here, I just want to thank you again for doing this interview and for you're being with welcome. us today. Nice to meet you. Nice to get to know how to use Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Noreen. Okay, bye.